King, comfort of the spirit, mm -hmm. and to give her president, for us all things, mm -hmm. treasure, blessings, and give her life. Come and abide us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls of it. We'll be doing chapter 8 tonight. Um, and, you know, I've, you know, we've talked about various biblical translations, and on one hand, this is, this is one that I love to hate and hate to love. It's called the Orthodox New Testament. And on one hand, it reads like somebody's Greek homework, um, you know, because it has all the tenses and all the verbs exactly as they are in the Greek, and you know, which makes sometimes makes for absolutely, completely unfluent English readings. On the other hand, it's a very li very literal translation without a lot of uh, uh, inter interpretation in order to make it more fluent. And it uses orthodox theological terms, um, uh, which are you know, directly from the Greek um, and are still used in, in orthodox vocabulary, um, as opposed to translating them um, into the Protestant terms, which is what all of the, uh, the Protestant Bibles do. Um, so there's always <clears throat> one, of, one of the big difficulties with so many of the, of the translations, including the, new, the, the original King James, the RSV, the, the new King James, which are probably the best. Then there's a new one, the English Standard Version, which is pretty good. Um, which are probably the best translations uh, for Orthodox. Um, the NASB it can be a little bit um, I don't know. I don't. I don't like the flow of it so much. Uh, it's a little too colloquial, um, but it's still fairly accurate. And then you've got the Protestant Bibles, like the. Uh, of the living trend, of the living Bible, which is uh, it's not even a translation; it's just a uh, a kind of a a vague a transliteration. Tra no, it's it's just a vague interpretation. A transliteration would mean that uh, it was written uh, in English letters, but it's still the Greek words. That's a transliteration. Um, the new the li the uh, well, there, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of them. New, uh, uh, there's the New American Bible, which is the Catholic one. There's the New American Standard one. It's, it's uh, pretty Protestant and it has a lot of Protestant interpretations. So the NIV, the New International Version is very Protestant and has. Um, as Protestant theology read into the text. So, and I was very, very surprised, even the uh, RSV, the uh, Revised Standard Version, which was from 1948, which is one of the most trusted scholarly ones. I was reading along, and they had one interpretation, which instead of translation of the text was a, a quote from Calvin. And it's like, no thank you. <laughs> it, it just it just shook, shook my faith, and you know ultimately uh, there is there there is no official Orthodox text in English, probably because the only official Orthodox text is the original Greek, and it's the uh, it's the it's the received text, it's the Byzantine liturgical text, um, which was used uh, when the King James was translated in the sixteenth century. 17th century and um, as the basis, but then the Protestants have come up with all these other texts, and if you if you get a uh, you know some of the scholarly critical uh, texts of the New Testament with more footnotes than text, um, it gives all these variant readings and and 
Um, it's basically up to the uh, uh, opinion of the scholar what reading they want to include and, and what they want to exclude and what their theological bias is and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but their criterion is, is different. Um, their criterion for authenticity is what's oldest. The orthodox criterion for authenticity is what the church has authorized. Um, because for us, the, uh, the text stands on the authority of the church. It was, it was authorized, it was written by the church, it was edited by the church, it was published by the church, it was authorized by the church, and it's distributed by the church. And as I like to say, um, it's our book, uh, we let them use it, <laughs> but um, they uh, often, shall we say, misunderstand it, to be kind. Um, this is produced, the Orthodox New Testament is produced by um, uh, a guy in Colorado who uh, styles himself Patriarch of Denver and Lord of the Universe or something like that. <laughs> yes. Not Denver and all America? Yeah, actually he's in Leadville or someplace like that. Or what, or what's the name? Buena Vista. Buena Vista, Colorado. Out in the middle of the mountain. Um, he, uh, he's got his little skeet, which is, which is actually pretty cool because it's got all solar and all of this stuff. And, um, and then there's a nun who lives nearby, and the two of them have put out volumes and volumes of stuff. Um, uh, he used to be Rokor at one time, and then is often canonical Never Neverland. But the translation is, is a very solid, literal translation. So um, that can be helpful. So he's a scholar then? Uh, he knows Greek very well. Let's put it that way. Um, What's the title? The Orthodox New Testament. Oh, okay. Right. Um, he's also the guy um, who uh, did most of the icons for Transfiguration Monastery. Are you familiar? Back in the 70s and 80s, Transfiguration Monastery in Boston produced vast numbers of uh, um, uh, icons that you know were uh, printed, you know, color printed, and then mounted on boards, and you know, it was not they were nicely done, and it was the quality was good, and and he was the iconographer who did that, and he's painted all sorts of churches, and and uh, he'll take money from anybody uh, while calling them non-canonical and going to hell and all of this stuff, but their money is still good, so. Anyway, um, anyway before, before, then before I get to the to chapter 8, Australia was great. It's an awesome <laughs> place. Uh, and the church there is very interesting. They're, stu they're still stuck in Slavonic. Um, all the services are mostly in Slavonic. There's, there's very little English. Um, and uh, even though all the priests, I mean, the language of the hall and the language of the altar is all English. <laughs> you know, so people are just, you know, speaking English to one another, but you know, service has to be in Slavonic. Not that anybody understands it very well, but it is what it is. Um, so, uh, but very kind, very kind people. So Hebrews chapter 8, and this is the uh, literal translation. Now in reference to the things being spoken of, the chief point is, we have such a high priest. In other words, there's been this long development of, the, uh, uh, of, of Christ as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And who is Melchizedek in all of this? Uh, and we've been and we've uh, dealt with that in some detail. 
Uh, let's actually, let's start. Everyone's phones are going to do it no matter what. Flash flutter works. Yeah, flash flutter. Mm -hmm. Even when you put them on silent, you do it. Let's um, start with uh, verse 25 of the previous chapter, just to kind of get into the context. Wherefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. This is Jesus, of course. Um, since he ever liveth to intercede on their behalf. For such a high priest was fitting for us, holy, guileless, undefiled, who hath been separated from the sinners and hath become higher than the heavens, who hath no need daily as the high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for those of the people. For this he did once for all after, after he offered up himself. For the law appointeth men high priests who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which is after the law, appointed the Son, who hath been perfected forever. So we talked about all of that, right? In the last time? All right. Now we start on, on 8. Now in reference to the, the things being spoken of, the chief point is we have such a high priest who sat down on the right of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a liturgist, of the holies and of the tabernacle, the true one, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high, high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is necessary for this one to have something also which he might offer. For if indeed he were on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Flash floods here. No. <laughs> um, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is necessary for this one to have something also which he might offer. For if indeed he were on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who worship a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, even as Moses had been divinely warned when he was about to execute the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern which was shown to thee in the mount. But now he hath attained a more excellent liturgy, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which hath been enacted upon better promises. For if that first covenant were blameless, a place for a second would not be sought. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord, and I will consummate a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took hold of their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I cared not for them, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will give my laws into their mind and write them upon their hearts, and I will be to them for a God, and they shall be to me for a people. And in no wise shall they teach each, each his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, for, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawlessness in no, in no wise will I remember any more. In the saying, New, he hath made the first old. Now that which is becoming obsolete and growing old is near to disappearing. It's very close to that text. Okay. Uh, 
there's a whole lot in here. Um, one of the things I'd like to read from, um, is from Revelations chapter 5. Actually, let's start with chapter 4. And it's, it's a vision of the heavenly liturgy. Um, say verse 10. For now verse 8. Has everybody read the, does, is, is everybody familiar with the book of the Revelation? No? That's good, because you're not supposed to read it until you're 30. <laughs> and I think you got a few years to go before that, huh? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, let's read both 4 and part of 5. Um, 4 1. After these things I saw, and behold, a door which had been opened in the heaven. And the voice, the first one, which I heard, was as a trumpet talking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show to thee that which is needful to take place after these things. And straightway I came to be in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and upon the throne one sitting in appearance like a jasper stone and a sardius, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in appearance like an emerald. And round about the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones the twenty-four elders sitting, having been clothed in white garments, and upon their heads golden crowns. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and sounds and thunderings, and seven lamps of fire are being burned before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And there was before the throne, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne <coughs> were four living creatures full of eyes in front and at back. And the living creature, the first, is like a lion, the second living creature, like a calf, the third living creature, hath the face as of a man. Ah, very good to see it. The fourth living creature, like an eagle, flying. And the four living creatures, one by one, each of them having six wings apiece, are full of eyes round about and within, and they have no rest by day and by night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is and is the coming one. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and, th and giving of thanks to the one sitting on the throne, to the one living to the ages of ages, the 24 elders shall fall down before the one sitting on the throne and shall make obeisance to the one living to the ages of ages and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord, and our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power for thou didst create all things, and because of thy will, they kept on being and were created. So you see the, the awkwardness, but this, these are like, this is an exact translation of, of the Greek uh, tenses as without making it more fluent. <laughs> um, and I saw on the right of the one sitting upon the throne, a book having been written from within and without, having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals of it? And no one was able in the heaven, nor on the earth, nor underneath the earth, to open the book or to look at it. And I was weeping much, because no one worthy was found to open the book, nor to look at it. And one from among the elders saith to me, Cease weeping, behold, the lion the one of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, did conquer so as to open the book and the seven seals of it. And I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God being sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he hath taken the book out of the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
and they sing a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to open the seals of it, for thou wast slain, and its redeem us to God in the blood in thy blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And it's make them kings and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And I saw and I heard, as it were, a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, the one having been slain, to receive the power and the wealth and the wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature was in, which is in the heaven and on the earth and underneath the earth and in the sea and all the things that are in them heard I saying, To the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might to the ages of ages. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and made obeisance. Now, in symbolic language, that's the enthronement of Christ in heaven. Okay. Sounds like part of the liturgy, too. It does, doesn't it? So, this is very, this is, it's very, it's very important um, to make that connection. It's very important to understand that, you know, that, uh, uh, that Christ having, um, having, uh, having, having died, ascended in, into heaven and offered himself to the Father um, and, and was co-enthroned with the Father and, uh, and received worship with the Father as the Son in the Holy Spirit um, from, from, all, from all of heaven, from all of creation, from all the angels and archangels and, and all of the hosts of heaven as well as, as, well as all created beings and, and so forth. Um, So that would sound some that would uh, this is something that would be absolutely radically heretical uh, to a Jew mm -hmm. um, who would totally deny that there is a son um, because but but it's actually also a scene as it were right out of the first temple. It's an enthronement scene um, of the Davidic king um, who is uh, enthroned uh, in the Holy of Holies, uh, uh, surrounded by the angels and the images of, of all of the angels uh, and all the priests who are understood to be angels um, uh, and singing his, singing his praises. And uh, and exalting him as the deified Son of God. So you have in the first temple, you had this, um, you know, you had this uh, uh, image of the uh, of the of the king who, at his enthronement. Um, became Emmanuel, as it were, um, in, as the, he became the type of the king, uh, or the type of God with his people. Um, he uh, was given to be able to wear uh, the golden crown, which said Yahweh on his forehead, um, which is and, and when we sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which we do all the time, right? That's what it means. It's, refer it's referring on one hand to the king, um, the Davidic king originally, but that Davidic king, the type of him is uh, fulfilled in, uh, in Jesus Christ because Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord also means blessed is the Lord who is coming. In the name of means in the, as the person of. It's a Hebraism. 
So, um, so on, in this, on, on this first layer of meaning, um, we have of uh, Christ as the great high priest. Uh, remember that he is not just the priest, but he, but he's king, prophet, priest, and king. Um, and that that priesthood and that that kingship is the uh, our, uh, our types of uh, uh, are the fulfillment of the types uh, that were in the Old Testament in the first temple and which becomes the uh, the heaven and which is the heavenly reality, which is manifest, and uh, and which is ultimately also to come um, at the second coming. So, in typology, you always have three elements. You have the type, the antitype, and the archetype. Um, and this is just kind of basically. You know, you can't understand the scriptures without typology. Uh, Protestantism lost the idea of typology almost entirely. Most of Ro Roman Catholicism, for the most part, lost the idea. Um, but it, but it's essential in the Old Testament, um, and it's essential, as you can see, in the New Testament, because the whole point is that. Well, while there is an earthly uh, antitype in which we participate, that is a reflection of and a participation in the heavenly archetype. Um, and then there are historical uh, antecedents, which are types. So, for example, the, Davidic, the enthronement of the Davidic king um, uh, uh, from the first temple, um, who would have, would have been enthroned uh, between the cherubim on, on the chariot throne, which was above the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Is that a type, or does it foreshadow in some way the incarnation then? Well, yeah, it, it does foreshadow the incarnation, because the uh, uh, the Davidic king mm -hmm. um, and the high priest later on uh, were understood to be uh, uh, when they were consecrated um, that they became the deified son of God. Okay, they became Yahweh in the midst of his people. He, he became kind of the represent, not just the representative, but the very presence of, of God in the midst of his people. Um, and the other, um, so typolo typology is very, very important. One of the, um, uh, one of the best ways, uh, best phrases to remember about typology, um, uh, especially in relation to this kind of biblical typology, is on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? Very, you know, we, how many times a day do we say that? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and the, the point is, is not only that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but that we, that we worship on earth as it is in heaven. And by worshiping on earth as it is in heaven, we participate in the heavenly worship. In synergy, in cooperation, in not just cooperate, cooperation in the sense of working together, but in the sense of um, co-operating. In other words, be, uh, um, doing, the same, doing the same thing mystically that in the that we while we do the earthly ritual it's a participation in the heavenly ritual now in the Old Testament um, Moses was given a vision of the uh, of the tabernacle and 
in great detail of how it should be laid out and how the how the rituals should be done and 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 all sorts of instructions. There's another version of it in Ezekiel, um, and uh, then. While here in the, in the book of, of the Revelation, it's not exactly like uh, there's instructions as to how to do it all or how to lay out the temple. That, uh, that was all within the, the oral tradition of the church. But the basic ethos of Christian worship is on earth as it is in heaven. And Christ enthroned Think about, think about the liturgy, okay? What's the first, when, and, the, and, and a bishop's liturgy, a hierarchical liturgy, is the clearest expression of that. So what happens at the beginning of the hierarchical liturgy? Um, the bishop is sitting with the people, facing the altar, right, in the middle of the church. There's the antiphons, and then and really that is the time of the gathering of the church. And it's interesting that um, in uh, the original liturgy, which is the liturgy of St. James, um, the prayer that the bishop is reading at that time talks about the gathering of the church. Now there was only one hymn at that time, now we've got three long antiphons um, waiting for everybody to show up. Um, and then then comes the entrance, right, into the altar. But, and with that, what, what is it? Um, uh, there's the prayer. O Master, Lord of God, who is appointed in heaven orders and hosts of angels and archangels for the service of thy glory, grant that with our entrance there may be an entrance of holy angels and archangels serving with us and glorifying thy goodness. Pray to thee our glory and our worship. And then, um, there's, there's the entrance of the bishop and the priests um, into the sanctuary, um, the sense, sensing of the sanctuary, and the ascent to the throne. And so, so that the, the, um, the bishop is enthroned as the image of Christ in the midst of his people. Um, and then come the readings, right? The Trisagion and the readings. Or that's at the Trisagion and then the readings. Um, and so there's a, there are, um, there are parallel movements in the liturgy. There's two fundamental aspects of the liturgy. There's the liturgy of the word, um, and so you've got uh, the enthronement of the bishop um, as the image of, of, of Christ with his people, surrounded by the presbyters, right? The elders. The word presbyter means elder. It also means priest. Presbyter got, got um, pres, presbyteros in Greek got uh, contracted to prester in German. And that turned into priest in English. Hmm. This is still the same word. And it means old man. It means <laughs> elder. Oh. It means elder. I heard someone use in Spanish once, he was talking about he was an, an elder in, in the Jehovah's Witness. He said, I'm a soy anciano aquí. Anciano is the same word for an, an older person, mm -hmm. an elderly. Mm -hmm. So he used that ecclesiologically. Yeah. Um, well, that's probably because, well, Jehovah's Witnesses' translations are just all messed up. I mean, they're theologically just out in Never Never Land. Um, and their translations are make, ha make absolute nonsense of the text. So um, it used to be very handy to get a Jehovah's Witness um, interlinear translation of, of the New Testament. So you would have the Greek text and a, and a direct English um, translation of the words in the English uh, right under the Greek line by line. And then you would have their parallel translation 
which absolute, which bore almost no resemblance to the English that was under the Greek, and certainly bore no resemblance to the Greek text. It was very sad. Um, but um, all that aside, the ethos. Um, so anyway, so the beginning of the liturgy, like that is actually a repetition of this image that we saw in the book of Revelation, right? The ascent, the ascent of Christ to the throne of the Father and the taking of the book, right? Um, actually, the book is then given to the deacon and the deacon, you know, they read the scriptures, but... Um, there's, I, this is a, a, it's a very ancient image. Then, at the second part of the liturgy, there's another um, uh, parallel action, which is, um, so you've got the liturgy of the Word, and then you've got the liturgy of the Eucharist. And so, at the great entrance, what's brought the chalice and, and the, uh, with the wine and, and the, and the discos with, with the, the bread for the offering, right? And it's all cut up in the proscomedia, all prepared, um, are presented to the bishop. Um, then there's the commemorations, um, although that's much, more, that's much more recent, the commemorations. In the ancient church, there were no commemorations. It was all done in silence. Um, so the elements were brought out, they were presented to the bishop, and where, where did the bishop put them? On the throne. In other words, on the altar table, which is called the throne. Um, and it's, it's another image of Christ coming to be enthroned. Um, and, of, uh, and then what happens is the, uh, the consecration. Um, we, this, the creed got stuck in there about the fourth century, kind of a late development, you know, <laughs> um, fifth century. And then um, the consecration, the recitation of the, uh, and especially like in the liturgy of St. Basil, as in the liturgy of St. James, you know, you've got this recitation of the whole history of salvation um, in the anaphora prayers. And St. John Chrysostom is very brief. And then and and the recitation of the about the uh, uh, the Last Supper, how Christ took the bread and the wine, saying, "Take eat, and take drink." Um, then the offering, thine own of thine own, of the bread and the wine to God. Um, thine own of thine own, we offer unto thee on behalf of all and for all. Um, okay, think of that in terms of. Christ offering himself on the throne of the Father. Thine own, but thine own. And so, and then that's followed by the, um, the epiclesis, the, the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon us and upon the gifts um, to, in the liturgy of St. Basil, to bless, to hallow, and to show this bread to be the precious body, this uh, cup to be the precious blood, uh, um, changing them by thy Holy Spirit, um, uh, and so you have this, the image fulfilled of, of Christ on the throne to be given, to be given to the people. Now, um, in the liturgy, what we what we have is Christ who offers Himself to the Father. With His, He brings His own blood into into the into the tabernacle not made by hands, as the great High Priest, and gives Himself as food to the faithful. In the forms of bread and wine. So He offers His, his, his Himself in His. His, his life, his blood uh, to the Father, and we receive him back at, as bread and wine, in the forms of bread and wine. 
um, and which then fulfills us um, as Christians, uh, as members of his body, as having his blood in our veins. So, um, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see the connection? Okay. Um, so it says, um, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty um, in the heavens. Okay, That's, we read about that. A minister or liturgist of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. In other words, Christ, <clears throat> Christ didn't function as a priest in the, um, in the second temple in Jerusalem. He didn't function as a priest in the... Um, uh, in any temple made by hands, he made he functioned as a priest uh, uh, in offering himself in the temple not made by hands. Uh, that uh, in the at, at the at the throne of God, which is which is in heaven, um, as the high priest of the eternal liturgy. Uh, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. In other words, um, Jesus was not a priest according to the law of Moses. Hmm. He couldn't be. He wasn't, he wasn't a Levite. He wasn't from the, from the um, tribe of Aaron. He was from the tribe of Judah. Um, and uh, he would never have have been a priest on earth but um, and this is this is why he part of why he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek um, um, for if he were on earth he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law okay. who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. In other words, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, and the second temple were all inadequate because they, they were types, but not the fulfillment. Hmm. Um, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better premises, promises. So, not only was the temple not, full, not of the, the Jewish temple, not only was it not um, uh, the fullness. It was it was it was just a type, but not but that fulf the fulfillment of that type had not happened in earthly time. Um, Christ Christ transcends also the covenant with Moses. Um, he's not a, he's not a priest according to the law of Moses. He doesn't offer sacrifices according to the law of Moses. He's not there to renew the law of Moses. Um, he's there to set it aside, to transcend it. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. This is radical stuff, you know. If you, if, if you were a Jew reading this, this like, I'm sure this would be very offensive. Probably now criminally liable or something like that to read this a lot of it. Um, for if that first covenant had been faultless, 
then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. And this is a, this is a quote from the prophet Jeremiah. This is a, a very, one of those kind of key quotations from the Old Testament on which, um, which is like the foundation of, the, of uh, Christianity. <laughs> Um, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, not according to the covenant of Moses. Mm. Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. That's heavy duty. In other words, they broke his covenant, so the Lord cast them off. Yeah, the, let me... Hold it there. And I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In other words, he makes the covenant with Moses obsolete. Um, and this new covenant is, is entirely different than, uh, than the covenant with Moses. Covenant, if you remember, the covenant with Moses um, was conditional. I will be your God, and you will be my people, if you obey me. So, um, and they didn't. You know, the, the Old Testament is a story of how they didn't, for the most part. Um, and so a new covenant, a different covenant, was necessary. Not one written on tablets of stone, not one written on pieces of paper. This is not the New Covenant. The New Covenant is written in the heart by the Spirit. And, and it's the, the New Covenant is this new relationship between God and man in which God puts His, his Spirit in us and, and teaches us intuitively His law. His, his righteousness, his, uh, and, uh, and having, having remitted our sins in, uh, through his, uh, through his great sacrifice, through his, this, the, uh, sacrifice of himself, the atoning sacrifice, um, he has overcome all sin and does not disregard sins any longer, but has, but has received his people who remain, who are faithful to him. Um, okay, Lance, you had a question. Um, a new covenant with with Israel does does that mean that Israel this is is more of a spiritual concept than an actual physical location or exactly ethnic? It's yeah, it's 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 the belief. It's uh, it's a covenant by faith. And that's and so there you have this is the foundation for all of Paul's writings. Uh, for for the book of Romans, for example. This is the foundation of it. Um, and going back to Jeremiah, um, that it's not uh, it's not a covenant according to the flesh, it's a covenant according to uh, to faith in the spirit. And it's interesting. Um, now, of course, it's, it's a quotation from Jeremiah. Um, he says, 
I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hmm. Remember, Israel was, the kingdom was divided. Oh, yeah. And there was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And um, uh, they weren't really talking to one another. <laughs> um, and, um, but, uh, and, uh, and Israel got carried off in, into captivity long before the uh, long before Judah did. Um, I think what 754? 150 years difference. Yeah, 150 years. And uh, so it was, uh, uh, and that gives an idea of kind of where Jeremiah sits in that. There it comes in in that. Um, And later he says, for this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. So on one hand it's Israel, on the other hand Israel and Judah. Um, so he says, I will put my, my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall re teach his neighbor and none of None his brothers saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, kind of interesting to look at. Uh, first, first epistle of St. John. In this light. Um, first John chapter 2 verse 20 but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things I have not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth Um, jumping down to, to 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So I don't want to go into into chapter nine tonight. So, so what do you all think? Does it make well, sense? Let, let me ask a ir irreverent sure. question. So, so the the second covenant is necessary in part because the first covenant was incomplete or imperfect. Mm -hmm. Why was the first one incomplete or imperfect? Why couldn't we have had the first covenant to be the full? Final covenant. Well, actually, that was it. Wasn't really the first covenant. It was the covenant with Moses. Um, there was also the covenant with Noah. There was a covenant with Abraham. There was so there were several covenants. But um, basically, it was necessary to uh, uh, to tutor uh, the first covenant. And Saint Paul says it was necessary to uh, to have the have the law as a tutor to. Uh, to teach the will of God. Um, uh, it ultimately didn't perfect anybody. It, it didn't, um, uh, it wasn't really about salvation. Hmm. It was about how to live in this world. Hmm. You know, we tend to, you know, we tend to, we tend to project our Christian ideas um, hmm. onto, onto Judaism, and that's not really what Judaism is about. It's how we live in this world, and then God will judge, and that's 
that. And then, there, of course, then there are those Jews who say that there's no, there is no judgment because when you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. <laughs> but um, for the other Jews who uh, who believed in the resurrection, well, um, they believe that there was a, a judgment and will be accountable. Um, but it, but it's not about going to heaven and heaven or hell or something like that. It, it, everybody ends up in shell someplace. Um, in that form of Judaism. Um, so you can also, I think we can also say that God chose to work with the Jews and to, and to slowly to, um, to reveal his will through them, even whether they accepted it or not, um, in order to bring forth the righteous one, Mary, um, who is the ultimate person, the ultimate human person, who could bear the Christ, hmm. the one who would be obedient to God, the one who would uh, completely submit to God. Um, and so for us, Mary is the ultimate human person because she, she lived in perfect communion with God and thus um, uh, there was nothing contrary to God in her. Um, uh, and so she was able to bring forth him who is himself the, the manifestation of that, new, the, of that new covenant. Because obviously, as the incarnate Son of God, Christ has... Uh, the spirit living within him. He's, he's not just a man, he's got, he is the son of God. And, um, and that um, reality, which he is, is then shared with us by grace so that, the, so that that reality of, of um, uh, the incarnation of the son of God becomes um, the reality of our adoption uh, to sonship, meaning also the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, so that so that the uh, the laws of God, in other words, the the will of God, is written in our minds and our hearts, which is the new covenant. Um, so it, there's it's it's not about any kind of obedience to external forms. It's not about um, it's not about keeping ritual laws. It's not about fasting rules and and washing of hands and dishes and and feet and pots and pans and all of that kind of stuff, which is what what the law uh, was about. It's not about it's not about it, these external forms of conduct. It's about a living ex, living communion with God. Which is the which is the very content of the of the new covenant. From a historical context uh, standpoint, Vladika, too. Um, yeah, I do. I do agree. Like on the on a phased approach, because there were harsh times, you know, mm -hmm. coming onto a land without food. I mean, just imagine the governance. What would it take? to keep that population under control. So harsh times calling for harsher measures. Yeah. And and more direct, more directive commandments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, in preparation, sort of breaking, it, just mm -hmm. like it happens to us, right? Breaking our spirit slowly to mm -hmm. bring us closer in communion. And, and even, even with all of that preparation, it's still to this day that there are people that will not, um, for a fact, will not accept Mary, right? Uh, uh, even among Christians that right. have, you know, divergent opinions. Yeah, so it's the historical context of how the, the covenant sort of evolved over time. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really, you know, it's important to look to, you know, God essentially chose this random guy in Mesopotamia, Abram, mm -hmm. to work with and to bring, you know, knowing in his foreknowledge what 
in order through him and through his his family, his descendants, uh, to bring forth the Christ, mm -hmm. the Messiah, who would be um, uh, not simp not simply the the Messiah for the uh, uh, for the Ju for the people for the Jewish people for the for the children of Abraham, but for the entire creation. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a fundamental shift in the New Covenant, um, which is really getting to God through His Son. Now, right, we have to go through Christ. Well, we're in Christ. In Christ. Yeah. yeah. If we're Christians, we're in Christ. In Christ, yeah. And, uh, so it's not a matter of having to go through Him, that we are, <laughs> we're in, in Him. In so. with Him. Yeah. yeah. We pray as though we are Him, right? Yeah. We pray in, you know, and ulti ultimately, you know, it's um, our prayer is an entrance, and especially in the liturgy, is an, is an entrance into His prayer to the Father, mm -hmm. and that's why we pray with one mind and one heart as the body of Christ, and are able to say, "Our Father." Um, so it's that mystical unity that's created by the Spirit um, out of a multitude of persons um, united in one mind and one heart so that we might pray with one voice and one intention and one word. When you say it's not about ritual, but yet we... We have ritual. Oh, we have ritual. We have ritual. What I was referring to is not about fulfilling the Old Testament ritual of, of having to make you know all these different kinds of offerings for sin, and, and you know, you know, that all passes away. So our liturgy and the Eucharist is not. Um, it's not about regulations that we must right. follow as much as it is about. Unity with right. It's the manifestation. It's the actualization of our unity with God in Christ by the Holy Spirit, and thus it replaces all of the liturgy of the Old Covenant. But we still say the Ten Commandments are binding. How? How? Can we... Well, the Ten Commandments are a a, a, a revelation of, of the will of God. But it's not a matter of, you know, you, you've got the Ten Commandments are, are one thing, but the Law of Moses is not just the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. It's the 650 ritual mm -hmm. laws. Um, Do you ever um, get mold in your bathroom? You have to tear your heads down. That's right. So, um, but how many people are going to do that? Maybe in Brooklyn, um, <laughs> you know, or now in Rockland, Rockland, Rockland County. Um, let's on the on the uh, Theotokos. Uh, just to Theotokos. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify the the development of the Jewish people uh, is is in receiving it was to bring about such a state of perfection to to to. To have someone like the Virgin, Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, mm -hmm. that can only have been done through the process of all the prophets that eventually allowed her to happen. Is, is right. Okay. Yeah, and so and so God working with the people of Israel over centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, um, whereas for the most part it's a history of apostasy. Uh, on the other hand, there are those who were righteous. And who were obedient to God, and who were um, in synergy with God, and who were filled with the grace of God. Um, now you look at the ancestry of Christ, and you go back and look up some of those people. Some of them weren't exactly, you know, pious, you know, people. They were kind of right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, but God worked with them anyway. Um, but. Uh, the Theotokos is the is kind of the ultimate um, f 
fruit of, uh, of that whole history of uh, God working with Abraham and all of his descendants and all the prophets and all the, the history and the kings and all of that stuff. Um, so. Ludika, if to, if just to boil it down, would you say that like uh, the ultimate goal being theosis or the uniting our, our, our will or through Christ, our will being transformed uh, to the divine, uh, that there's you need uh, purification to wash away sin and our original sin, mm -hmm. uh, which leads to enlightenment, which could be, I guess, the old covenants, which opens the door to the new covenant. Or is that an oversimplification? It's an oversimplification. Um, the, the old covenant was not the enlightenment. The enlightenment came through the um, uh, through Pentecost. Were, were, were they the coming fragments of, just, of or, or there was there were fragments of it? Yeah. Um, you know the prophets and um, uh, but. Uh, I mean, there, there was certainly, we would say that the people of the Old Covenant were certainly much more enlightened than the pagans. Hmm. So what would be the promise of the Old uh, Covenants then? If, what were the, like, if they were uh, steps of preparation towards the ultimate co uh, covenant, uh, did they have a, a means in and of themselves or were they just stepping stones? Um, it, the Old Covenant was stepping stones, basically. It was, um, uh, and you know, we, and we have the examples of the prophets. We have Joachim and Anna. We have the uh, righteous Simeon. We have, you know, other examples of people who, um, having been obedient to God under the Old Covenant, um, lived uh, in great uh, purity and holiness. But their ultimate sanctification um, is in Christ. Even, even the mother of God herself is her holiness. Um, she was holy uh, according to the law, but, uh, but, but that was still um, inadequate. Uh, her holiness came through her uh, uh, ultimately bearing Christ. Um, because she was in need of salvation as much as everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and that salvation comes in, in the person of Jesus Christ, um, not through obedience to the, to the law of Moses. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so before Christ, the best we could do was work on purification. In a sense, yeah. Um, if people were even aware of that. Um, that's not exa that wasn't exactly a lot of uh, the core of Old Testament spirituality. That's much more the New Testament or the era of the Church and Saint Paul and Saint Paul, you know, starting with the New Testament, the purification, illumination, to deification. One of the things that I think I read it in the um, footnotes of a Catholic Bible a long time ago was that the Jewish conception of existence after death is very similar, probably convergently, to the Hellenistic conception. There really wasn't anything to look forward to. Is that essentially true? or? Well, there's a lot of scholarly nonsense. One of, one of the biggest... One of the most damaging things, probably in, in biblical scholarship, was the uh, academic publisher parish. So people were forced to um, invent ideas, um, whether they had any basis in reality, and you know, and write dissertations about them and defend them, and you know, and there have been whole forests of, of of trees consumed in the libraries that were that were created, spouting absolute. Fantasy. How many angels can fit on the head of a needle? Yeah, exactly. from that onwards. Um, uh, 
one of the I tend I um, I'm very critical of, of certain kinds of scholarship, biblical scholarship. There's um, there's some that's very good, some that's very bad, um, some that's completely uh, based on on fantasy and opinion and, and political agendas, mm -hmm. which is most of the nonsense that you, if you go into a theological bookstore at a seminary, I mean it's and there's 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 lots of lots of stuff for toilet paper there, but there's, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's really not good for much else. Um, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. Um, uh, but then some of the scholars, have, have, um, you know, who don't have all, do, who don't have all sorts of, um, you know, stupid agendas like, you know, feminism or LGBTQ whatever stuff, and reading all sorts of nonsense into into the scriptures, which isn't there. Um, but rather, people who uh, are who really look at the scriptures for what it says, who look at the the surrounding literature, who look into the history, and um, and draw their conclusions from you know from the from the history as far as they know it and can find out about it. Then there's some valid stuff, and and we have to make use of that, and we have to have to be informed by that. Um, and there's one scholar in particular that I like, enjoy her writing very much, Margaret Barker, and uh, um, and she and she's a real scholar. In, in other words, her a lot of her opinions are summaries of vast amounts of other opinions, um, and I think and I really find that that her perspective, her scholarly perspective. Um, sheds a lot of light on the con on the text and on the content of the text. Um, some of the other stuff, I don't. <laughs> so, um, so what can I what can I say? Uh, did I answer your question? Not really, but no. So restate the question. The question was how similar was the. The Jewish and the Hellenistic conception. Oh, the Jewish death. and Hellenistic. Okay, the Jews has the idea of Sheol. The the um, the Greeks. Okay, I understand why I went on that little tirade. Um, uh, the uh, the Greek uh, idea of Hades. Now, one of the one of the scholarly ideas for the past several centuries is that um, uh, there was extensive Greek uh, influence from Neoplatonism in particular um, uh, on the New Testament and on and on uh, mm -hmm. contemporary writings and, and on the early church fathers. Um, Platonism leading into Neoplatonism and other kinds of, of philosophy. Um, some of the uh, some of the scholars that I've been reading um, Margaret for, Barker, for example, would dispute that. Um, there's a there's a there's a rather extensive um, amount of evidence that uh, uh, some of the early Greek philosophers, um, and I think it was Pythagoras in particular, uh, spent time in with the with the Jewish priests in Jerusalem. And and so that there's so that there was cross fertilization, and that what gets uh, so for example um, the uh, uh, the divine hierarchies of uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, um, you get some scholars saying, oh, it's all Neoplatonic kind of um, uh, interpretation of of Jewish material with some Christian. Um, add-ons and you know, and it's really just Greek philosophy, and it really doesn't have any. Right. Well, you got that on one hand. On the other hand, um, there's plenty. There's some rather significant scholarly evidence to uh, indicate that this was part of this 
basically the inner tradition, the priestly tradition uh, of the priests of the first temple. Hmm. Um, Sheol and Hades, you know, um, uh, you, you've, got, you've got this whole idea in, um, in Christianity and Orthodoxy. Um, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs of so on. He's freed, he's, he's emptied Hades. Now, that was all written in Greek, right? So there must have been some kind of conformity between the Greek idea and, and, and the Jewish idea. But there were multiple Jewish ideas. Um, just as there were multiple sects of Judaism, you had, you know, on one hand you had the Pharisees, which had, you know, an afterlife of, you know, souls would go to Hades, they would be judged, and, you know, and some might be better for some and worse for others, and, and I don't even think, I don't know they necessarily had a hell, except for the worst. Um, and then Sheol, or Hades was something, that was Sheol, and then there was Hades, that it's, you know, with the river, uh, Karen the, the river Styx and Karen the, you know, and, and so on and so forth, um, and that, and then you know, Christianity comes along and and Christ descends into Hades according to the New Testament, um, and uh, and empties Hades. Um, now there was another sect of Jews called the Sadducees who didn't believe in, in an afterlife. They believe that when you're dead, you're dead. Um, and there's no angels, there are no spirits, there are no, there's no nothing. There was God up there someplace. Um, and, uh, you know, it was basically, it was almost agnostic. Hmm. A kind of, you know, what I don't see what the point of it would be to, but it was you know, power and position and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, so, you, so you had this whole, this this spectrum, and I don't know what I don't know what all was in between there, you know, on the, on this spectrum. Um, uh, on one hand, um, definitely there was a uh, an appropriation of Greek philosophical language because the Septuagint had been translated into Greek in the, in the third century BC. The New Testament was written in Greek. The fathers mostly wrote in Greek at first. So there's, you know, and concepts would, um, would morph, you know. So you, maybe you, maybe there was a Jew but who spoke Greek, and so his, but didn't really speak Hebrew. He knew there was a Hebrew concept of Sheol, but he, but being a Greek speaker, he would probably embrace the idea of Hades. Um, there's, there's no, there's. There's no one answer to all of that, and, there, and there's no uniformity. Um, but one of the one of the things that is important is that um, the scholars are, are beginning to uncover these differences between <coughs> these different groups within within Israelite religion, of which Judaism was only one strand. Mm. Mm. And that's important, and that's really important. Judaism was the religion that came out of the out of the exile, and that wasn't the whole. That wasn't all the the uh, people of Israel. That was just the intellectuals. That was just the 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 elites who had been carried off, and then come, and then sent back uh, with money from the Persian king to rebuild their temple, and they had already embraced the. Uh, the theological reforms, radical theological reforms of Josiah, which happened before the exile. And so what came out of the exile was, was a radically different religion um, than the religion of the first temple. It had some of the same terms, um, 
and some of the same basic text, but then some of the other texts were very different. And some of the, uh, um, you know, and then there was lots of other differences too. The, the whole calendar, the liturgical calendar, they couldn't do the old rituals from the first temple because there was, you didn't have a Holy of Holies, or you, the Holy of Holies was empty. You had, there was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no, all of this stuff was gone. And they couldn't even properly reconstruct the priesthood. So, um, uh, so there was a, a rather important segment of, of Israelite society that rejected the Second Temple and rejected Judaism. Um, and it's probably those people that became Christianity. Mm -hmm. Which could like, which could likely be sixty or seventy or eighty percent of the Jews, or of the Hebrews. So, is it also possible that when Vespasian destroyed the, the temple in seventy A.D. and along with it, the the, lang the Hebrew language possessed less significance than Greek, and maybe that's why the Greek, the Greek language probably was divinely chosen to be the Septuagint, maybe even the New Testament. Well, the Hebrew language was, uh, had already become uh, strictly a liturgical language by the fourth century. You know, by the, by the time the people returned from exile, um, they weren't speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic. And, um, and the people in, in Palestine spoke Aramaic, they didn't speak Hebrew. Um, so Hebrew was had to be learned, um, and, it's, and it differs from Aramaic. I guess there's some mutual. Yeah, they're both intelligent languages. Yeah, both, um, sister languages. They're not the same language, but they're not. Yeah. They're probably closer than than together than either is to Arabic. Mm -hmm. But just because you understand. Uh, Aramaic doesn't mean you're going to understand Hebrew. So like I know Spanish very well, and when I, the language, the Romance language, I can understand that I never studied, and I, when it's spoken, I understand most of it, especially if they speak, if I listen to everything, the whole paragraphs is Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I've never studied. Yeah, but go to Italy and you'll be really confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds all. It all looks the same. It sounds the same, and it means very different stuff. Yes. Part of, well, part of the reason I, I ask is I, I'm sometimes have theological conversations with one of my best Jewish friends, and he we were talking about some of the apocrypha from the Old Testament. He uh -huh. says, "Yeah, all those guys were just Hellenized and basically didn't understand what Judaism meant anymore." And obviously, he's talking from a broader Israelite perspective, I suppose, and also from today. Well, but, that's, uh, a, that's a contemporary scholarly perspective. Right. And uh, uh, what this, the scholarship that I'm working from is saying, no, that's, uh, that stuff actually is a, um, a lot of it is actually the uh, continuity of the uh, uh, priestly perspective from the first temple, um, okay. which was rejected by the Jews. You know, I, if, if the Jews rejected spirits, they rejected angels. So, for example, angels were largely written out of the Old Testament. They were edited out. The, the, the scriptures of the Old Testament, especially the Masoretic text, you look in the fourth book of Esdras, which is really interesting. Um, it's, they set it back in the time of the return from the exile, but, in, but most likely what they're talking about in, in symbolic languages what happened after the after the destruction of the temple, <laughs> the second you know the second temple, um, and you had one guy, Ezra, who reconstructed the entire Hebrew canon. One guy, because it says all the books were burned when Vespasian destroyed the temple. Um, that would, that's, that's pretty, and that's pretty radical. And that's one of the reasons that, so in the Masoretic text, um, which is the product of that, 
um, you have some very different readings and some and a lot of uh, material that is uh, well as my friend Margaret Barker puts it you know uh, the the Masoretic text is basically an anti-Christian polemic and a total and is, and is absolutely definitively not acceptable for use in in Christianity. Hmm. Now, that's the basis of all English translations. Because the Protestants thought that they, what the Protestants did in the 16th century is they reconstructed Christianity from Judaism, from contemporary Judaism. Hmm. The, in other words, the rabbinic Talmudic tradition, which actually is not the root of Christianity. It's the temple tradition that's the root of Christianity. Um, and so there is no continuity from, you know, the, from the rabbinic trend, tradition. They, <laughs> you know, they rejected Christianity from, from the get-go and the roots of Christianity. Yeah. So, 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 so given the Jewish exile, the Masoretic text that was written a lot later, in yeah. the Septuagint and the Babylonian Talmud, where does that place the Jewish nation in importance to New Israel or Christianity? The church is the New Israel. I mean, Sam, where does that place those who were Jews after the New Covenant came into being, who were still in opposition to Christ? Where does that place? Well, that's um, uh, basically uh, they're those that we have to pray for that they will convert to Christ. As St. Paul says, because there's only one, there's only one access to God, and that's Jesus Christ. Um, you know, you and you, you really read the New Testament. It's it's a pretty rapidly anti. You know, Jesus condemns condemn, condemns Judaism as heretical, mm -hmm. as missing God, as having a wrong conception of God. Because if, if Jesus, you know, Jesus clearly presents himself and un, is un, understands himself as, as Yahweh, the Son of God. Um, in, in the temple tradition, in the first temple, um, there was a multi-personal idea of the Godhead. God, the, God Almighty, the Father, His Son, Yahweh, his mother, the Holy Spirit, um, uh, who is also wisdom. Um, then there were the other sons of God, but we don't talk about them so much. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, who are usually the, referred to as, as angels, the angels. Um, and uh, so you have this, this tension. And, and it really, the tension goes back to the reforms of Josiah, who radically changed the the, the concept of God. You know, from from a multi, and even even the even the um, the confession, the the great you know confession, um, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear Israel, the Lord. Yeah. God, the Lord is one. Right. Um, it's plural. Hero Israel, the, the Lord our God is a unity. Is really what it's saying. The, um, uh, what is it? Uh, jet lag is hitting me. <laughs> <laughs> it, take, it takes about two weeks to get over jet lag from Australia. I'm one week into it. <laughs> Um, well, they don't use the word God, they're using the word Adonai, which is Lord. No. Well, that's Lord, but what... Um, Elohim? No, Elohim. Elohim. What's Elohim? But in the it's confession, a plural ending. And it's plural. But in the confession of faith, they're using Elohim, which is the we. Yeah. So, but they use Elohim in other places. Right, but Elohim is, 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 a, is plural. Is, is, a, is a plural form. Yeah. Elohim is a unity, is the... Phrase, um, which is very different 
than saying that God is a, is a monad. Yeah, the Elohim literally means God's throne. Right. So, so, um, so it's a very different understanding than um, than your typical American Sunday school. <laughs> but I think, and and quite frankly, um, you know, this is this is this is much more a scholarly approach than the teaching of the church. Teaching of the church kind of takes the Old Testament at face value. The fathers generally take the Old Testament at face value, and they're not interested in all of this. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they don't write about it. They don't. They don't speculate on it. Um, uh, and they really, you know, they re weren't. They used the uh, Old Testament in an entirely different way. They used it almost entirely as a uh, as a typological or as a an allegor a, sor a source for typological and allegorical uh, theological um, development, as opposed to pulling apart the history, pulling apart the you know because this all of this stuff is, comes from a very deep reading of the history and uh, and the associated books, for example, um, Book of Enoch, the Book of uh, the Assumption of Moses that, um, you know, some, some of these other texts, um, which are actually very important to understanding um, the Old Testament as it is, um, and were extensively used uh, by the early church. That's kind of fallen by the wayside. Hmm. But... Um, I got interested in this um, uh, through, um, he's now the OCA Bishop of the South, Bishop Alexander Galitzin, um, who's a professor at Marquette in Milwaukee. I've known him for 30 some years, um, uh, but uh, uh, he, he taught in the uh, patristics department, which also had a um, New Testament and intertestamental studies department. Um, and uh, it had, there's a lot of um, uh, material on, uh, on Jewish mysticism, mm. which is really fascinating. Well, they retained a lot of the... Right. Well, there's the Merkaba mysticism. So, okay, so for, so for example, I read that whole passage in Revelation, right? That's essentially also Merkava mysticism, the ascent in the spirit to the, to the throne of God in heaven, the vision of heaven, and the vision of the chariot throne. So uh, we've got the prophet Elijah coming up the next day or two. Um, he, what, how, what happened with Elijah? He was taken up in a chariot, right? Mm -hmm. in, in fire. Um, it's, a, it's a, a vision of the chariot throne. Margaret Barker speculates that, um, that, that the language, um, because of the language used when, um, in, the, uh, in the Gospels, that when Jesus arose from the waters of baptism, the heavens were opened. Well, that's shorthand for seeing the chariot throne, beholding heaven. Mm. Um, or the vision of the Son of Man in heaven. So it's 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 very interesting, you know, pulling all this stuff together, um, and uh, uh, and it, and it's and it's very and the Book of Revelation becomes something very important um, as foundational to the text of the rest of the New Testament. St. Paul had a vision too, right? St. Paul had a vision too, but, but the most important vision is, 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 the book of, uh, is in the book of the Revelation, which is the vision that uh, Christ had, which he showed to St. John. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was St. John. Um, so. Make sense? Any, anything not? What is the Lots. test 
Twelve house. Fourteen. <laughs> Four, just fourteen? Oh, he said the test. That would be. Oh, good. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. You can have a test if you want. I'm here. No. No test. But you will be quizzed at the last one. <laughs> It is truly me to bless the Ephraim of us, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compared than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the word. Truth the Ephraim of us, we magnify thee. The bless <coughs> blessing of the Lord be upon you, through his grace and love for mankind, always now and to ages and ages. Amen. Amen.